Hello everyone. Today is going to be a complete lesson on how to do remote viewing from start to finish. I hope you will enjoy this process with me as I will be going through the entire SRV method so that you can get basic remote viewing skills under your belt so that you can use these skills in your life so that you can see through time and space without the limitations of linear perception. Remember, this is a natural ability that all of you have. All of you have done remote viewing as a natural part of your existence in the past. And today we are just going through the process of bringing back that skill through the SRV method. So without further ado, let's uh, refer to my iPad, which is where I do all of my remote viewing sessions. You can use paper and pencil if you wish. And let's begin. So if you looked at any of my previous lessons, we are going to start off with a 20 minute meditation. The 20 minute meditation, we're going to use a mantra called Shanim Mana. I'll write it down here. Shanim Mana. So, Shanim Mana. Shanim Mana. Let yourself say Shanim Mana calmly over and over again. That is your one job. Don't chastise yourself if you get distracted by having your awareness tugged off in some direction that because you just have a thought that has attracted you or something like that. Just remember, whenever you realize that you have drifted off into space of thought, that you come back to the mantra, Shanim Mana. If you can come back to the mantra, you're winning. So just feel happy, smile, be at one with yourself, and just say Shanim Mana. That is the only job. You want to do this for 20 minutes. And as you go through the meditation, as you're deeper and deeper into consciousness, just allow yourself to say Shanim Mana. Everything else that pops up and bubbles up as time goes on, it doesn't really matter. Just let it happen. It's like the bubbles coming up when you're boiling water. Just let them float up and float out. Don't be attached to them. And if you find yourself attaching to these things, just be happy when you catch yourself and bring yourself back to the mantra, Shanim Mana. So let's say it for uh, just a couple seconds together, just so you can get an idea of uh, pacing and the calm serenity of the whole process. Shanim Mana. Shanim Mana. Shanim Mana. Shanim Mana. Shanim Mana. Now, you're going to make sure that you do this sitting upright if you can. And hopefully, if you're able to have the flexibility to sit cross legged, that would be nice. But if you can't, just sit in a regular office chair, something like that. Just make sure that you're comfortable. And make sure that you just keep going with this mantra for 20 full minutes minimum. So feel free to pause the video right now and go do a 20 minute meditation. Keep a timer on you if you need be, but if that alarm that lets you know that the meditation has been 20 minutes is jarring or has a lot of staccato sounds to it, you might find that discomforting. So try to have something soothing and calm like a bell or something that's more peaceful to bring you out of that tranquil state because we don't want to jar the mind. We want to make sure it is calm and settled as we're going through into this remote viewing session. Ready? Great. See you in a bit. All right, you're back. Well, it's good to see you again. So let's uh, move on to the next thing, which is the SRV affirmation. As you can see here, the SRV affirmation is just an affirmation. SRV stands for Scientific Remote Viewing, if you don't know. 
And the SRV affirmation basically is, goes as such. Please read it aloud with me now. I am a spiritual being. Because I am a spiritual being, I am able to perceive beyond all boundaries of time and space. My consciousness is ever present with all that is, with all that ever was, and with all that ever will be. It is in my nature as a human to be able to perceive and thus to know all that there is to know. Everywhere, at all times, I seek to learn and thus to evolve, to further my own personal growth and to assist others in their growth. I direct my attention to a chosen point of existence. I observe what is there. I study it carefully. I record what I find. Notice that I didn't rush through saying that. You want to make sure that you say it slowly and deliberately, allowing all of the words to sink into yourself, to process all of it as it comes. So, as you've done your 20-minute meditation, which, by the way, I should have pointed out about the 20-minute meditation, you don't have to keep a very strict, rigid tempo to you saying Shanim Mana. I've had sometimes, and quite often actually, meditation sessions where my mantra tends to fade from thought, and I have these moments, these long arcing moments of just silence and peace, where no thought comes about, and it's just this long extended time before I bring in that mantra again. Sometimes I could guess that maybe a full 10 minutes go by before I actually say the mantra again, and there are no other thoughts that are popping up in my mind at that time. You want to make sure that you really shoot for a very deep and tranquil state when you're meditating. And as you see lots of bubbles and percolations of thoughts and ideas and what you're th thinking about for dinner and what you're going to do later on and who's this going to say and what does that mean to you, all these sort of thoughts that are just pop, 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 popping off like popcorn in your head, just let them be. You don't fight them to get them to go away. You let them do what they want to do, which is pop around and just anchor yourself to the mantra, Shanim Mana. Watch all of that chaos float around and just be aware and mindful of it. But the only thing that really deserves your attention is the mantra, Shanim Mana. As you are finishing your meditation and going on to the SRV affirmation, you will be happy to see that that requires the exact same methodology as the next step in this remote viewing process. Each word in the SRV affirmation is a form of neuro-linguistic programming that programs your mind to realize what you are capable of, that you are a spiritual being, and you are able to perceive through all time and space. And we're about to do it together right now. So, the next thing I want to show you guys is the Advanced SRV Vocabulary List for Describing Target Elements. All of these papers can be found on our website at farsight.org. You want to make sure that you just go through this if this is your first time trying doing this. So we have base surfaces, land, water, atmospherics, structures, and many more. These basic target elements are basic terms that can describe basic features that together comprise virtually all elements of corporeal existence. For example, we tend to use these low-level terms. So, for example, if I'm feeling something that's hard, I'll say this is a hard, man-made base surface, if that's something that I'm perceiving. These are all low-level terms. I'm not going to feel something and then say, oh, that's the asphalt of a road right off the bat. That might be what it is, but during the SRV procedure, we want to keep our conscious mind at a very low-level state. So we want to make sure that we're always saying things with low-level terms, and anything that's high-level we will call a deduction, something that we'll go into later on in the lesson. So, 
Take some time just to read the advanced SRV vocabulary for describing target elements to yourself. Base surfaces, land, water, atmospherics, structures, natural objects, subjects, mountains, non-surface structures. Notice that we don't call them UFOs and we don't call them airplanes or helicopters. We call them non-surface structures, a low-level term that is all-encompassing of what we will further go into with later interrogation of the data as the session goes on. Light, general environment, energetics, ag activity, sounds, temperatures, dominant session elements, and sketches should include some of the following elements. I'll be honest with you, I always skip that part, so I'm not going to describe it. All right, so let's go through the advanced SRV template together here and now. So your first thing on the second page is the target coordinates. You can read all of the in conscious mind and subspace mind instructions on your own, but let's just go through exactly what I pay attention to as I go through a remote viewing session. First things first, target coordinates. Now, I have another video that can show you exactly how I get these target coordinates, and they're always just coming from a random number generator. As you can see, Pythonista has a target that I, this is a script that I actually wrote in Python, and I added this as a widget to my iPad. You can also go to the Farsight website and find an eight number to random uh, number generator. I've actually also used random numbers sometimes from just picking random numbers that I find on the back of nutrition facts of a barcode on like a, a, a can of soda or some sparkling water or a, like a Nutrigrain bar or something like that, you know, just a, uh, just any, any random numbers will do, but uh, we prefer to use, in a more official capacity, a random number generator, one you can find on our website, or uh, you can check another video on my YouTube channel, Aziz Brown, that uh, has an instruction on how to get this exact widget on your Apple iOS device with Pythonista. So, the next thing you would wanna do is get a sticky note or another piece of paper, or you can use your phone as well to take a picture of that. And you wanna put it off to the side so you can refer to those random numbers just by glancing up to the left of the desk or wherever you're sitting at the time of doing the session. I'm standing up right now, so I'm just gonna be holding my iPad and talking about everything that I go through. Let's go and write down these random target coordinates. So eight, oh, okay, well it changed. <laughs> Five six nine seven one four two eight. Five six nine seven one four two eight. Five six nine seven one four two eight. Notice I put a slash in between the four numbers. Four numbers slash, and then another four numbers. That is the SRV way of putting all of our, our random target coordinates over there because we're going to write the first four numbers and then underneath it we're going to write the second four numbers and after that we'll let an ideogram out. So the next thing we're going to do is the session number. Everything else here is for organizational purposes only. So since this is a practice session we're going to write down session number one because it's our first practice session together. And then for experiment number we're going to write down practice because this is something that we're going to do to practice. The data type is going to be three if you're doing it solo, or if you have a monitor present, you're going to write down four. Technically, you're doing this solo because I'm just a video talking to you, teaching you the methodologies. So let's write down three. In the monitoring level, let's write down solo. The interviewer is basically going to be a monitor, but we use the word interviewer because if you're not learning remote viewing, if you're not a student at this time, and you're actually running on an actual project for Farsight or for whatever remote viewing group that you may be a part of soon, or uh, just a personal thing that you have a monitor present for, you just write down their name. And we actually use the word interviewer because at a point, you're not really learning how to remote view exactly with the session. You're more or less, you're there at a target. You're completely blind to the target. You don't know anything except for these eight numbers, these target coordinates, and you don't know what to look for. So the person who does know the target, who's not telling you the target, is the 
interviewer. And the interviewer is the one who's going to tell you, all right, now you look over here, look into that subject's mind, tell me what they're thinking, look over there, move to this event. You don't really know what to look for because you don't know what's, what, what's important there. But the interviewer does. So say for example, you're, well, I don't know, you're uh, looking at Jesus and Jesus is doing his Sermon on the Mount type of thing. You might see a guy up on the mount, but you might not know exactly that he's the person that you're there to investigate. So the interviewer would come in and say, okay, well, move to subject X. And then you go to subject X, and then the interviewer would tell you, do a deep mind probe on subject X. And then you go into the mind, and then you begin to have a telepathic communication at that point. We'll get to all of that, but that's the point of the interviewer. The interviewer is basically the person who's directing the perceptions. The remote viewer is more like a pair of binoculars, and the person who's holding the binoculars tends to be the interviewer. So it's good to make some friends doing remote viewing so that you can trade back and forth between being interviewer and remote viewer so that you can figure out the secrets of the universe together, which is infinitely more fun in my opinion. P.S. This stands for physical state. If your physical body is not okay, then tend to yourself. Put the remote viewing down for a little while and make sure that you're healthy and happy going into this. You want to be calm and you don't want to have a, a debilitating injury that's taking up a lot of your mental attention. So otherwise, okay. ES, emotional state. If you've gone through something traumatic so far that is uh, really causing it uh, causing yourself a lot of difficulty just sitting with yourself and it's created quite a bit of emo emotional turmoil in you. You don't really want the emotional state to just be out of whack and you should basically be able to gauge this just during your meditation. If you're really jittery and amped up and stuff like that, maybe meditate for a little longer than 20 minutes so you can get that down. If you've gone through something traumatic, maybe give yourself a week or something to get over whatever's been going on and allow yourself to calm down a little bit and be more at peace with yourself and in your own skin. So emotional state, let's write down okay. I will also point out that a lot of the energy work that a lot of light workers tend to do is quite beneficial at this point because the more your emotions are calm and tranquil, the better and clearer your remote viewing is going to be because there's less confetti or snow globe stuff that is floating around because of any emotional or mental volatility that may be going on in your subconscious or even your conscious mind. Conscious mind. <laughs> so, advanced perceptuals. This is basically something, if you're writing down all this stuff and in your head you're saying, I know it's a mountain, I'm about to look at a mountain, you want to get that out of your head before you go forward. Because if you're thinking, I'm about to look at a mountain, then all you're going to be imagining in your head is, in a mountain, is a mountain. All the confetti that you're trying to calm down, it's all taken the shape of a mountain. And you want to make sure that you just get that stuff out of your head and push it out. And make sure that a good way you do that is with our first deduction. You basically would draw out the mountain, you might call it mountain, and then you would put the pen down and then take your hands off of whatever you're touching and put them flat on the desk if you're at a desk or on the ground if you're on the ground or if you're sitting cross-legged maybe just put them on your knees or something like that depending on if you're using a desk or if you're using an iPad or something like that. If you don't have any advanced perceptuals, let us erase this. If you don't have any advanced perceptuals, why don't you just write down none? Don't try to invent advanced perceptuals if you don't have any. If you get to this point and you don't have any thoughts that have been plaguing you of what you think the target's going to be, just write down none. Let's move on. The rest is self-explanatory. It's your name, the date, and the time. These are also just for organizational purposes because you want to make sure that during a scientific experiment, you're giving yourself a good record keeping a good chance at good record keeping. So, yeah. Write your name. Aziz Brown. Maybe you have better handwriting than I do. And the date, 7 of May 2021. And the time is 4.41 p.m. Very good. So this is our first page. So we're going to number all of our pages. Remember that, guys. Number your pages. If you aren't using the iPad 
and you're using actual loose leaf paper, you wouldn't believe how much of a nightmare it is once you've got like a 25 page great session and then you trip and drop the whole thing and then all the pages scatter about. You might think it might not happen to you, but no one plans to have an accident. Those accidents can and will happen the more you get into this. Be a good scientist and number your pages. All right, so we're going to the next one, next page. So this is going to be page two. On page two, we're going to go through a ideogram warm-up session. So these ideogram warm-ups are going to be an attempt where we are going to be writing out our random target coordinates and then going to the ideograms. So let's describe what an ideogram is really quickly. An ideogram is what I'm showing right here. You have structure ideograms, you have land ideograms, mountain, subject, water, energetics, and movement ideograms. Well, let me write down some of these ideograms. These ideograms, you want to write them down quickly. You want to say these words to yourself as a practice on a blank piece of paper. You want to say these words to yourself and write them down as soon as you finish saying the word. Not before you finish saying the word, not during you saying the word. You want to be able to say structure and then draw out the structure. So, just so you can see, structure, structure, structure. You see what I'm doing? It's structure. Structure, structure, structure. You don't have to do every single one of the structures, but it's good practice to try to get all of them in there. Let's move on to land. It's just a straight line across, really easy. So let's just say land, land, land. See, just keep doing that. Mountain, 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 mountain. Subject, 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 subject. Water, 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 water. All right, so here's where I get into a little bit of debate with people. Obviously, my water ideograms are way more wavy than the other official water ideogram here on the page. I just like mine better. That's it. Moving on. Energetics. So the energetics, that is erratic chaos. It's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Energetics. 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 You see? Now let's go to movement. So movement, movement, movement. Those ones tend to go on a little bit longer, but as you can see, I'm here at, the, here at the edge of the page. You don't want to do that. When you're doing a remote viewing session, you don't want to have your hand be all crunched up at the bottom of the page. Do whatever you need to do to give yourself ample space so that you can not mentally feel like you're hindered as you're going through the, uh, your perceptions or your drawings or anything, even if you're just writing down words. That when you mentally allow yourself to feel like you have to cut stuff off, truncate data, because you're running out of space, you're losing valuable data. You could, you're making a mental subconscious thing in your mind, like a, like a roadblock that's going to stop the flow of data. So you want to make sure that you're stacking all the cards in your favor here. You want to make sure that you're able to give yourself enough space to where you can just go in whatever direction to do whatever you need to do. Let's do movement again. Movement, 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 movement. See? As you can see, movement also looks very similar to land, at least like with this one, looks very similar to land. You really just want to do your own best guess for these types of things. And you'll see more of why I say best guess as we go into the ideogram warm-ups. All right. So, let's do an ideogram warm-up together. Okay, so I've got the random target coordinates up in the corner, and typically you wouldn't want to have these on the same page. You would want to put them on a, on a, as a picture, take a picture on your phone, put them up there. I mean, typically you wouldn't be doing a remote viewing session standing up like I'm doing right now, but this is just for educational purposes, so I'm not really going through the actual remote viewing thing. I'm actually just going through the methodologies, which you will do as well, and then you'd be able to get some good data from this stuff. So the way you want to have it come out. Five, six, nine, seven, one, four, two, eight. You see right there? What do you, what did you gram does that look like to you? The IL right here, that's your best guess. You're giving your best guess of what that ideogram is. So let's write down. Subject. Boom. You're doing a great job, guys. All right. So. A, that's the describing the movement of the pen. So, curving, 
upwards, curving over, curving under. That is describing the movement of the pen because we went curving upwards, curving over, and then curving under. That's it. So then we're going to probe into here. Probing is the lifeblood of all remote viewing. What we're going to do here is you're going to probe in and you're going to feel an immediate response back, immediate kickback. Just be open to it. Don't try to dig for it. Don't feel like you got to be an archaeologist going. Just probe in with the intention of having something come back to you. And we're going to set the parameters right now. I'm going to write them down over here. So you want to have either hard, you want to say this to yourself before you probe. Say hard, soft, semi, hard, semi, soft, wet, or mushy. All right, hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, wet, or mushy. You okay? All right, so I'm going to probe into the subject ideogram. I'm going to say it to myself, hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, wet, or mushy. I probe in, I touch it. You see, I'm touching the subject ideogram. You see me with my pen, I touch. That is the probe. The second that I make contact, that is me probing, moving my awareness through the pen, into the ideogram, into the target, going to the subject or whatever, just going wherever I end up in the target, I don't know. Then I probe in and I'm saying to myself, what is it? Hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, wet or mushy? I probe in and the first feeling I get back of which one of those accurately describes it, soft, okay. I'm going to write down soft. Now, just try to follow along with me right now. I have this whole procedure memorized because I've done it so many times. So don't feel like you're right now like I'm going to get this right. I'm not going to reveal some target at the end. Right now, we're just going through the methodologies. And if you can know the methodologies, then you can practice this on your own, and then you can do this with a target. And I'll tell you how to get that whole experiment set up at the end of this methodology uh, lesson type of thing. So, next one we're going to do is, in this blank space that we have here, the next one that we're going to do is natural, man-made, artificial movement energetics. Great. So we're going to do another probe. Probe in and that first feeling that you get back, the first initial feeling. Are you beginning to see why, it's, why it matters that you're in a calm and tranquil state? Because if you're not imagining all these other things coming in, you're not imagining what you think it's going to be, then your conscious mind isn't doing stuff because you imagining something is your conscious mind putting stuff out there. You have to be a receptive radio signal right now. You have to be able to receive the information. So you're going in there, you're pursuing the target, you go in, you probe, you say to yourself, natural, man-made, artificial, movement, or energetics. Probe in. Touch it, touch it. If this is a subject, you're going through here. If I'm the subject, you're going in, try to grab its face. Grab, just go in, just, just do this. It sounds weird, but probe in. Use your awareness, probe in, and just feel the face. Try to feel the subject's face. Try to feel it. Try to feel what you're, what you're touching. If it feels natural, feels like soft and natural, okay, great. Write down natural. Boom. You're touching a subject's face. You're touching a subject's something, and it feels soft and it feels natural. Now, sometimes you're going to get perceptions that don't really add up. You're going to get a subject, and you're going to say, "Okay, I'm going to probe. I'm going to touch the face. Is it soft? And I'm expe you're expecting soft or something like that. Don't expect anything. You'll figure out very quickly as you're doing better and better sessions. It's good not to expect anything. Some subjects don't have, like imagine if the subject has a motorcycle helmet. You're going to touch the face and you're going to feel hardness. You're going to feel like, like I don't know, man-made, hard. It's going to feel weird. So, you're not going to immediately know, oh, he's wearing a motorcycle helmet. If you did feel it and you, and you wanted to say that, you're going to make a deduction. Off on the side, you're going to say, if you felt like this was hard, 
and you imagine to yourself, like, this guy's got a motorcycle helmet on. That's the conscious mind filling in the gaps of an, of a, of an odd perception. You have to realize that. Your conscious mind will readily fill in the gaps of perceptions. So, big capital D minus, and then, or a hyphen, and then you would say helmet or motorcycle helmet. That's high level data. We don't say helmet, we say headgear. And we wouldn't say it at this point. This point is the er, is, is warm ups. You're doing a warm up, so really there would be really no reason to even put a deduction at this point. But we're going through the methodologies. I want to make sure that I talk about all this stuff when you're doing the probing. All right, so if you got hard and you got man made, then you might still think it's a subject. But what if you try doing you, you try doing something and you felt like it was hard and then you felt like it was energetics? Hmm. That doesn't really make sense. A subject feels hard and energetics? It's all, all this conflicting data doesn't really paint a nice picture. So for the B, your B is your best guess. That's what the B stands for, best guess. I don't know if it's really what the B stands for, but in my world, that's what it stands for, best guess. So I'm going to put down no B. However, let's remember, if it was soft and natural, fleshy body, soft, it feels natural, then let's just say your best guess is that, yeah, it feels like a subject, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. You know, it's a, see if it seems like a subject, feels like a subject, just put down subject. It's your best guess. Now, as you'll see on this page, we've got three sections to do this three times. And then on the next page, page three, you do it three more times. Bada bing, bada boom, bada ba. Take some time, pause the video, do this for yourself. Three times, then another three times. Doesn't matter if you're actually saying like, am I really perceiving anything? Just try to get the, the flow of the hand, the methodology. Just try to build up the muscle memory of doing this and try to let all of the process sink into yourself. You're doing a great job just getting this far. You're doing a wonderful job. I believe in you. You should believe in you too. All right, so let's go to number four, page four. This is gonna be a great one, guys. So this is basically the meat of the session happens on page four. So. What you're gonna do is you're going to put down your random target coordinates right here. Now remember, this is bad practice to write it up in the corner right here. I never do this. I never write the target coordinates up in the corner right here. But I'm just teaching the methodology, so I'm gonna put the coordinates up there just because I'm, I don't have a desk in front of me. I'm not, there's not a floor where I can take a picture and put my phone on the floor right there and I can refer to it. I'm standing up doing a presentation for you guys, so I wanna just be able to see it, so I'm writing it in the corner right over there. But if you at home, if you're sitting at a desk, get a sticky note or something, just write it on a little scrap piece of paper, put it off in the corner so you can look elsewhere on a separate piece of paper. That's the, that's the official way, so. Anyway, don't ask me why, it's this, that's the way. That's just <laughs> it's the way I was taught, and it was a big deal when I was taught that way. All right, so I'm pretty sure it has to do with some sort of mental thing you want to just make sure that there's not there's, there's le the least amount of clutter on the page so you can just put just all your perceptions diarrhea of the pen is a, is a statement my dad always says just let it flow just let the pen do what it needs to do all right so so you need space all right so let's go through and do the random target coordinates and all that ready say it as a, do it do it with me actually let's do it together with the fast tempo as i'm barking out the numbers after you finish those eight numbers, you want to make sure that your pen touches the, the space next to it and let an ideogram pop out. Any ideogram. You want to make sure it happens fast. You're not skipping a beat. If I'm doing five, six, nine, seven, one, four, two, eight, boom, then the ideogram pops out. You want to put it really quickly, all right? Follow along with me. Just watch, and then like we'll, you can rewind and let it happen again. Five, six, nine, seven, one, four, two, eight. All right, so subject ideogram popped out again, but you saw what I did there. I said five, six, nine, seven, one, four, two, eight. And then I put the pen right to the side like I'm about to write another number, but 
an ideogram pops out. You want to set that mental parameter. An ideogram is supposed to pop out. Now, if you're going out and you're doing these weird ideograms that are just like, like you're not really able to hone in yourself to do just one of the regular normal ideograms, just do it. <laughs> Just give yourself parameters. It's like you're a computer program. These are the parameters that you have to give yourself. Give yourself the parameters to do standard ideograms. And how do you better give yourself parameters? Well, use neurolinguistic programming. Just say it to yourself. Standard ideogram labels, please. I say please. People don't really say please that often, but you're talking to yourself, you're talking to your higher self. Be polite. Standard ideogram labels, please. And then try it again. Again, again, you want to do this as many times as possible. You want to build up the muscle memory for it. So get a blank piece of paper and just keep doing it if you're having struggle, if you're having trouble getting the tempo down. Five, six, nine, seven, one, four, two, eight, boom. The ideogram coming out right after that. If you're a little too slow with writing just for your own personal pace, then do it as fast as you can. Everybody's body's different. So this is the way I do it. This is the tempo I do it as. If you need a little bit more time because you're just not able to write as fast as I am, then that's fine. You just want to make sure that you're giving the least amount of time possible for the conscious mind to come in and, and make decisions. You don't want it to make decisions. You want it to happen automatically because you're just trying to keep up. Good. All right, so let's go through the process. I'm going to go through it a little faster this time. Ideogram label. What does that look like to you guys? Looks like a subject ideogram to me, so we're going to write down subject. Describing the movement of the pen. Let's just write down curve. Actually, you know what? Let's, uh, let's erase this ideogram and let's do a different ideogram just because I'm supposed to be teaching you guys. So let's just, let's pretend it's a mountain ideogram. Let's pretend that's the one I let out. So what does it look like? It's a mountain. All right. So sloping upwards. Peaking, sloping, downwards. Fantastic. Probe in. Hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft, wet or mushy. Does it feel hard or soft? Okay, was it feel soft or I soft? Natural, man-made, artificial movement energetics. Probing in. Oh, it feels natural. Okay, natural. Now you might be tempted to say something else, like, oh, it's soft, it's natural, feels like sand to me. Cool down, cool your jets. We're gonna get to all that stuff. Just soft, it feels natural. Okay, let's move on to the next one. You got your data, don't worry about it. So, it's the three and the four, we haven't talked about this one yet. Three and the four, that is static or dynamic, is the third one, is three. And that's going to be a D plus or a D minus, lowercase d this time. The D plus, this one, this one means dynamic. The D minus, this one means static. All right, then C plus, oh, my voice cracks. <laughs> this one is complex. And then C minus, is simplex. So basically for three and four you want to just say, all right, well, I'm probing in here. Feels like there's not a lot of big movements or anything like that. It just feels like I'm kind of just like there. And you just want to, you don't want to just sit and wait and just be like, is anything gonna move? Just probe in, take a quick look around it. Feel like everything's just am I just sitting right here? It feels like I'm just sitting on the side of a slope or something like that. All right. D minus, static, so then you just write down D minus. Boom, you're done. Go to number four. If it feels like there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on and you can't really get a handle of what's going on, don't try to figure it out, just write down C plus, complex. If not, if it feels like it's, it's like really dynamic and there's a lot of things going on, you're just gonna do D plus. And then if it feels like it's very simple, not a lot's happening though, uh, C minus, got it? So dynamic and static, that's more for the movement, the activity. The simplex and complex, that's just, is it a complicated type of scene that you're looking at? Or does it feel very simple, not much going on? Don't dwell on these things too much. These are just getting the, we're just getting the engine going right now. For the B, best guess, if it feels like a mountain, seems like a mountain, 
If you feel like it's more of a hill than a mountain, whatever, you're just going to call it a mountain. The mountain ideogram is for that irregular type of topography. So let's write down mountain. All right, so now we're going to go back to this advanced SRV vocabulary page. The advanced SRV vocabulary page, this is where we're going to go through each and every one of these things. What's the first one? Base surfaces. So we're going to go back. Base surfaces. We're looking for base surfaces. I'm going to probe right in and all I'm looking for is, is there a base surface? If I try to push my awareness into the ideogram, through the pen, into the ideogram, I just try to push myself down and I'm just like, is there, is there something? Is there something below me here? And it's like, okay, there's a base surface. Then I'm going to write down, base surface. All right. What's the next thing? Level or irregular topography. These are the next really two things. This thing's kind of just redundant right here. It says surfaces, but you know, level or irregular topography. Is the topography level flat or is it irregular? Is there a slope to it or something like that? Now, if it, I'm on the side of this mountain, oopsies. If I'm on the side of this mountain and I'm probing in right here and I'm feeling like, okay, it feels like there's a, feels like there's a slope to this. All right, then I'm going to write down irregular topography. Now, I will be honest, the more psychic that you get from doing more and more of these types of things, the more you'll be able to really just have more vivid perceptions of all sorts of stuff like this. But if you're just starting out and you're going from being like straight up Helen Keller to trying to get like just basic psychic abilities, then just do, do it the way I'm talking about it. So it's just, uh, you just try, try to just go with the really low level things because if you're trying to jump too far too fast and you're trying to say, I'm seeing all of Mount Everest and this is like, you're just here, you, you probably might just be on a golf mound, you know? And then you're just making up Mount Everest because you're feeling like this is a regular topography. Are you realizing now, this is why we have to use these low level terms to temper the conscious mind. Keep saying like, chill, relax, relax. We're just finding out, is it level or irregular topography? We're not throwing ourselves in the Himalayan mountains because you might just be sitting on a golf course. Just be calm with it. All right. And that happens for everybody. You're inevitably going to have one of those situations where you're going to be doing some remote viewing session and then you think like you're looking at some vast reptilian invasion or something like that. And then you find out later, oh, I was in a Walmart. So, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so. Next thing is next is uh, land, which land, I do feel like that is a bit redundant with the, with the base surfaces thing. You can go through it on your own. Water. I'm going to go to water now. So I'm going to probe in and all I'm going to do is just look around. Is there any water there? I don't see any water there, so I'm not going to write anything down. If I did see water, I'd write down water. I don't have to describe all this stuff about the water. I don't have to say all these amazing things like the water is over here. It's in a river. It's doing all that stuff. Just relax one step at a time. We just noticed that there's water there. That's all you're going to write down is water. Then let's just write down. You can, you can probe again. If you did see that there was water, you probe again and then you can ask yourself, all right, well, is there a land water interface? Is the whole thing water or is there like a point where the water and the land meet? Then you would write down land water interface. You can also do more tests, ice or snow. And as you can see, as you probe, you're basically asking a yes or no question or a, if they give you a two options, ice or snow type of thing. Is it feel like it's like a cold type of solid type of thing with the water or is it just liquid? You know, type of thing. It can be cold liquid, but that's fine. Is it liquid or is it just more solid type of formation of the water? So you want to go through all of this and they're all just yes or no questions, basically. Atmospherics. It's just a smell. Does it smell like his natural smells there? Does it smell like his man-made smells? You probe in and you just smell. <laughs> Don't use your physical nose, but use your energetic nose. You probe in and just your awareness to <laughs> and then smell through in the target area. What does that smell like? Does it smell like there's no air at all? Write it down. Does it smell like there's smoke or burning sense? Write it down. Do you feel like there's cloud dynamics in the sky? Probe in. Figure it out. If you, if your first impression. The first feeling you get, that's the one that you write down. If you're sitting there and you're thinking about it and you're calculating, no. The conscious mind is what calculates. The conscious mind has no place here. 
The conscious mind has one job, and it's to make sure that you're able to pick your pen up and probe. It has no other job in terms of the actual perceptions of the remote viewing procedure. So you probe in and that first thing that comes back, it'll happen instantaneously. Ask and ye shall receive. You ask the question, you say structures. Okay, so structures is here on the, um, on the thing. So I'm gonna go over to the ideogram, I'm gonna probe in, and I'm gonna look around. Is there any structures there? I'm looking around with my mind's eye in the thing, I'm with my awareness, and I'm looking around and I'm just like <laughs> Okay, I see a little structure over there, little, little thing. That's all I'm gonna write down. So structure, oopsies. If you can write. <laughs> Alright, structure. Structure. And use better handwriting than I'm doing. My handwriting is atrocious right now because I'm standing up and I'm holding this and this hand's getting kind of sore. So structure. And then the next thing you're going to write down, okay, is there more than one structure? So you probe it again and you say like, okay, if there's more than one, it's like, all right, multiple structures. If it doesn't feel like there's more than one, then you just want to say solo structure. That's it. So let's write down solo. Solo structure. Now I'm just making these guesses. I'm not actually trying to perceive anything, but I'm just making guesses of stuff because I want to show you the methodology. Remember, I'm just showing you the methodology. Follow along just so you can practice. But this is exactly what remote viewing is like. When you actually sit down to do a session for yourself, you're going to be sitting down here and you're just going to be doing the exact same process. There is no difference between what I'm doing now on video for you and what I actually do when I'm doing a real remote viewing session. So, next thing is a flash sketch. So, a flash sketch, you're going to put the, put the clipboard or whatever you're working with, the, put it down on the desk, and you put your hands flat on the desk like this. I'll put this down. All right, so, you're gonna put your hands flat on the desk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand this way. So you're gonna put your hands flat, and then you're gonna tilt, you're gonna close your eyes. Close your eyes. Tilt your head up to a 45 degree angle. As you hit that exact 45 degree angle, allow an image to flash onto the blackness of your eyelids really quickly. Just allow it to just pop, just like that. And it's going to happen for an instance, and it's going to be like, you lift your head up and then... And then you're going to just draw it, whatever picture it was. Your intention is to see a wide angle image of what you've been probing and asking these yes or no questions for. So your intention is to see that wide angle image of it. So you're like sitting like this, and then you 45 degree angle, eyes are closed, hands are on the desk, hands are on your knees or whatever if you're meditating and a cross-legged type of thing. And then you 45 degrees up, you hit that 45 degree angle, and you allow that whatever to just flash on the blacks of your eyelids. I don't really like to... Uh, I don't really like to have a lot of bright lights on the other side of my eyelids because then I see the lights through it and it's kind of weird for me to perceive it accurately when I'm looking at that. It kind of distracts me seeing those bright lights on the opposite ends of my eyelids. So basically I would say maybe face a direction in the room where there's not a big bright light. I've got these big bright lights that are shining on me in the studio right now but you know for yourself where you are. Just face a darker area of the room, close your eyes, 45 degree angle upwards, and allow some whatever image to pop up on the backs of your eyelids. And it's the first image, the first image. This is a, I find that a lot of people struggle with this part, but just practice with it. Don't beat yourself up. Just keep doing it. Repetition, repetition. Just keep it going. Then you're going to draw it. So if I saw oh, this mountain right here, I didn't really see any other mountains, and I saw a little structure right here. Boom. That's it. And then remember to number your pages. So this is page five. You're done. All right, so next page, page six. Well, what do you know? It's the exact same as page four. Fantastic. So page five, page six, boom. Page seven is the exact same. So you're just going to repeat these things three times. So that's all you got to do. You repeat this process of yes or no with these uh, advanced uh, vocabulary sheet and you just probe in and you want to just get these, get the accumulation of data. And eventually you're going to have a huge list of all sorts of stuff here. Now, this is something that I see people doing on and off, but the D portion right over here, 
This portion is actually for, officially, it's for you to draw pictures. So if I'm seeing a base surface, a level topography, and a structure, and I'm getting like a mountain, and I think it's a solo mountain, there's no other mountains around it, then I'll probably draw a little mountain here. I'll probably draw things, like the pictures of things, as I'm going through. If I'm seeing like multiple subjects, subjects, maybe I'll draw like a, a, a bunch of little subject ideograms over here. I'm not really worried about being too detailed over here. I want to be more detailed when I'm over here with the flash sketch, because when I see it and I'm flat and it's like a, it flashes up at me, then I really want to draw this and take my time to draw this as much with as much detail as what flashed on the backs of my eyelids. So then I'm sort of looking at this sort of thing, and, and that might be what I draw in the D area. However, depending on the size of which you write, you might not have space to draw anything because your C area, as you're going through all of these advanced vocabulary things, you see there's a lot of words there. So you might end up drawing like a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, like there might be an NSS over here, blah, 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 blah. And so you don't really have time to draw any of the pictures or you don't have space to draw any of the pictures. That's fine. It's not a big deal. Make sure you just put the pictures as best you can over here in the flash sketch. Maybe you'll end up seeing a non-surface structure. And I don't really give too much, too much detail into these sort of things. You can always investigate further later on in the session. So you do this three times. You do this right for this one, you do it again, another flash sketch. You do it another time, and then boom, another flash sketch. And then now you probe and describe movement and activity. This is a newer page, so you just probe in there, and if you feel like you're seeing a bunch of subjects running around or something like that, boom, you just wanna draw, draw some subjects running around like that. If that's the activity you're seeing, then that's the activity you're seeing. If you're seeing like a non-surface structure beaming down some, I don't know, Wonder Woman like purple healing rays. So it's, it's beaming purple healing rays at people and curing them of whatever diseases, I don't know. Whatever you're seeing, you, you really wouldn't get to see the curing them of the diseases right off the bat. That's a, a pretty high level description. But if you're seeing purple energetics, Purple hues, you would write that down. Purple hues, energetics. And it's shooting from the NSS to subjects. You wanna label everything in your, in your sketches. Label everything. Like even for this one, I, I would say you would wanna label this NSS. You would wanna label this mountain. You want to label this structure. Because if you don't label things, then you're just trusting that people can somehow understand your drawings. And they're all going to, everyone who reads your session, depending on how good of an artist you are, they might not come to the same conclusions of what you're looking at based on your actual sessions. So you want to label everything because that's really just good practice so that other people can follow you along what the data is that you're bringing to the table. So. This one, um, we actually use this a lot more in the Futures Projects, uh, this page. So I'm going to skip it right now, but you're welcome to do it. All these dots here, you just probe in temperature. All right. I actually number these things when I do it. So I do four, five, six, seven. So then I do a one, and then I probe into this dot right here, and I'm probing into the temperature. Okay, the temperature, okay, I'm feeling like it's hot. So I'm going to write down hot. And then you just continue to go through. The, on the base surface, what are you seeing on the base surface? Probe in, I'm seeing a, stru a structure, maybe a mountain. Write that down. Foliage, and just really brief descriptions. You don't have to give the whole kitchen sink. So now let's move on to the uh, movement page. So you want to start off here at M2. This is where you start. Start right there, M2. So you probe here. This is just you on the base surface. There's that structure and so you can write down structure, and then you can say mountain. Great. Move immediately above the base surface. Okay, so say you're gonna, you're gonna get different data as you go through. So like over here, you see I didn't get any water. I didn't write, it, I write down any water. Maybe on this page, the next time you go through it, you do notice a little bit of water. 
That's fine, just add it in. Don't hang yourself up on the idea, well, I didn't see water before, but now I'm seeing water now. This is weird. It's okay. Just write the data as you go through. So at the end of, your, of more and more of the session going through, you're going to see a larger accumulation of the data, all piling up, all together, and then you're going to have a much more vivid picture once you're on page 12, 15, 20, or something like that of the session. So as we go through here, maybe immediately above, you're noticing water, and then you write down distant. So it's, you're, you're noticing a little bit of distant water. And then we always go one mile up into the sky, roughly 5,000 feet. So then we go all the way up, and as you're drawing, in your mind's eye, if you're calm, as you're drawing, you can kind of see like a VHS cassette and fast forward, just of you just sliding your awareness up, 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 and now you're looking down, and then you're able to see, just like, oh wow, okay, so now I'm seeing this mountain over here, I'm seeing the structure over here, seeing a big body of water over there, let me color that in blue, do 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 do, and then the horizons over here, and maybe a, little, a few more mountains over there. Because now when you're seeing, when you're probing into it from the M4, you're seeing everything from 5,000 feet into the sky. I hope you're able to follow along to the idea that all of these things are just directing your attention in a very calculated way. You're able to do all of this without the session paper. You're able to do all of this on your own, just sitting in meditation. However, the session, the SRV method, allows you to fine tune and direct your intentions when you have a clear mind in a very surgically precise way. And that is what helps make remote viewing sessions so accurate and so possible. I, it, it really can prove to yourself that you're able to do these things with the remote viewing SRV method. That is why I highly recommend you learn remote viewing, not just so that you can enjoy the aspect of nonlinear perception, but so that you can prove to yourself in a scientific setting, in a controlled environment, that with only eight random numbers, you can see anything regardless of the limitations of time or space. So, as you've directed your perception 5,000 feet into the air and then you probe the dot, then you can see the whole environment from 5,000 feet in the air. You don't have to imagine it, it's gonna, the perception will come to you if you just have a mind that you can calm and down enough to allow that perception to come. You ask with your intention, your feeling, and you will receive. So M1 is actually if you're going underground. So I'm not, I usually skip this. Usually the interviewer tells me, okay, let's go and look underground. And that doesn't always mean that there's something underground. We're just checking to see if there's anything underground. And most of the time that I have done the M1 just by myself, just thinking, let me see if there's something underground. 1,000 feet underground, do 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 do. And then I just don't, I just feel darkness and dirt and stuff like that. So I usually skip this part, unless the interviewer, if I'm doing a monitor session with an interviewer like my dad or somebody else who's directing my perceptions and I'm just the binoculars, if they're curious about seeing, like, okay, we're seeing a facility or something like that, a bunch of structures, let's go underground. Sometimes there is something underground if that's for a target that that is something that's interesting. Sometimes I, there is something underground, but I only go down a thousand feet and that's not deep enough underground for me to find whatever it is underground. So you, this is another good reason why you want to have the conscious mind really reined in. Because if the conscious mind says, oh, I'm in Area 51, I'm about to find some reptilians, I'm about to go and see some aliens, you know, you're going to just imagine all these types of things. And if you're just imagining all these types of things and the interviewer isn't sending you to those places, isn't trying to figure out those things, you're just going to give a really wonderful Hollywood movie script and nothing about it is going to be true. And the interviewer is going to know that because the interviewer has the target. Anyway, make sure you just do your meditation. That is really the biggest part. If there's anything you can take away from this whole lesson, it's to find that there is a very big value in meditation. Finding deep, deep, tranquil states of consciousness. You can do amazing stuff, amazing stuff, when you have a calm and tranquil mind. Really amazing stuff. Remote viewing outside of using the SRV, the SRV method, you can, you, you are God. You can do so much. All right. So, P2. 
This is the next one that you start off at, right there in the center. And that one is right here. So you want to start right here, start. Okay, so this is P2 and M2 are the exact same. So this, boom, they're the same. So you just want to, so with M2, you went up and down. You didn't go left, right, forward, or back. With P2, you're going forward, back, left, and right. So you want to make sure that you do, if you go forward, the next one you do is back. If you go left, the next one you do is right. Just you do the opposites, okay? So I usually go to P3 next. So if I'm here and I'm saying, okay, structure and a mountain. Don't just copy down the M2. You probe in again, re reacquaint your awareness with the target. Just be like, okay, I'm seeing the structure, I'm seeing the mountain, good. And then you go to P3. If you move 5,000 feet, because remember that's the lucky number, we go 5,000 feet into one direction, boom. All right, so I'm going off into that, into that right direction. So I just move into the right, 5,000 feet. And then after I get there, I'm looking around. If it just feels like I'm only seeing just like the mountain behind me and there's nothing else, then I'm just gonna write down mountain. And then I'm gonna go 5,000 feet to the other side. So then, boom, 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 boom. And now that I'm over here on this side, I'm like, okay, Feels like I'm a little bit close to the water. So I'm gonna say a land water interface. And then if I go to the P4 or something like that, then I'm gonna say 5,000 feet. And if I move forward 5,000 feet, maybe all around me is water now. So I'm just gonna write water. And then 5,000 feet behind me from the P2. So I'm probing the P2. I'm reacclimating myself to where P2 is. And then I go backwards, and then it's just nothing but barren topography. I don't see anything there. All right, then it's just barren, flat land. That's basically it. So I don't really remember what page number we're at, so let's just... Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, good. Make sure you keep writing your page numbers. All right, so the next thing. Flash sketch from M4. What's M4? Look over here. M4 is 5,000 feet up into the sky. You're a full mile up into the air. M4. Then you do the flash sketch. Put everything down. 45 degree angle. The flash comes in. And then boom, you're seeing everything from a top-down angle. You really just did a... So you see M4 right here. I drew a picture. You can use words or a picture at this stage. But when you do the flash sketch, it's a picture. So. If I'm seeing the flash sketch, and I'm just going to draw some random stuff because this is just a, a description. I'm seeing the water over here. I'm seeing the horizon over here. Seeing a bit more land over here, more regular topography. The picture's a little more HD in my own mind because I'm looking at it from a certain way. All right, great. And that's pretty much it. That is pretty much it. So. It's not that difficult. From a methodology standpoint, that is a full remote viewing session. When you get to this page, this is page 13, that is a full remote viewing session of a general base target. That's enough for you to practice. Now I'm gonna do three more pages with you guys just because I always do these three more pages. So I always make a new page. I'm gonna scratch out this flash sketch thing. And then I'm gonna say, move to the center of the target and describe. And then I put a dot. And then I'm gonna probe in and I'm just gonna get a bunch of words and I'm gonna put down a picture. So I'm moving to the center of the target and describe. If I'm feeling like, okay, I'm seeing the structure and I'm gonna write down structure. I'm gonna draw the structure. Maybe I'll add more details to it because it's been a while in the session and it's looking a bit more detailed because I'm looking at the same structure so many times. And then uh, I'm seeing subject, so I'm seeing a subject. I'm gonna write down subject. And I'm seeing this mountain, so I'm seeing a, a big, big mountain over here and then a big mountain over there. And I'll write this flat land over here. And then I'm gonna say mountain. And then another mountain. Boom, that. Then, keep those page numbers. 
Then let's get another page, scratch this out, do page 15. Then let's write down move to the target activity and describe. And then if I'm moving to the target activity, okay, I put a dot and then I'm seeing, okay, I'm seeing a bunch of subjects and they're running. And then I'm seeing a bunch of subjects running. Boom, 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 boom. I'm gonna label it subjects running. And I'll say multiple. Multiple subjects running. So if I'm seeing multiple subjects running in this direction, that's the activity that I'm seeing. Okay, great. And I just draw a little bit of the environment around them based on how I'm seeing it as I'm probing. And there's maybe another thing over here. Then I'm gonna get one more page, and this is the last page that we do for literally all the news sessions that you see everyone doing. This is the last page is um, move to the target event and describe. All right, so moving to the target event and describe. So you probe the dot and it's like, okay, well now I'm seeing, all right, I'm seeing a couple structures. I'm seeing this mountain type of thing and seeing some more mountains over here. I'm seeing a lot of subjects over here and they're running. So I'm gonna label it subjects running. And then I'm seeing this non-surface structure and I'm seeing these purple rays zapping down here. Purple energetics. Uh, projecting from NSS, that's the NSS, to subjects. Those are the multiple subjects. I'm gonna say multiple. And label things, so structure, structures, mountain, mountain, boom. All right, and that is page 16 officially. That is the end of the remote viewing session. Right there, that is a full remote viewing session. When it comes time for me to do the news session, uh, news like news one or news two, uh, that's the code name for it, it's just news one or news two. If it comes to a mystery session, all of that stuff, this is basically what I do. The first initial session that I do solo without a monitor, without an interviewer, and with the news sessions, I never have a monitor, I never have an interviewer for it, nobody does. So you just do one session and whatever you get is whatever you get. That's it. If you wanna learn remote viewing and you're just getting started and you just wanna learn how do I get a full remote viewing session done, just like the people at Farsight, that's it, you just saw it. That's the methodology. Meditate, practice, be patient with yourself. Learn how to calm the mind. If you need to, going to these things like Reiki sessions or QHHT therapy and stuff like that, those are incredibly valuable things if you just wanna be able to immerse yourself more in whatever energy work or light work or whatever stuff that is your cup of tea work that you do to calm the mind. The main thing is you have to calm the mind. If the mind is this like it's just always running boo 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 boo, like you're constantly on this caffeinated high from sunrise to sunset, you really gotta just make it so that you can calm yourself down even just momentarily with a little bit of meditation, you can get a good hour of calm mind. If you can meditate for 20, 30 minutes, then your mind will be in a much calmer state for the next hour. So if you can do that, then for that hour, you do a remote viewing session. Rehabilitate yourself so that you are able to do the natural abilities that you've always had before you were thrust into the earth prison. This planet is designed to make it so that you are always 
busy, running around, doing things so that you never have a chance to settle down and listen to yourself. You are your own best teacher. So here's the methodology. You have it. There is nothing I have held back in terms of basic remote viewing skills. This is a valuable lesson for you and for anyone else who can take the time to use self-discipline to improve their life by learning the remote viewing methods. Illustrated here and designed by my dad, Courtney Brown, at Farsight. He designed the SRB method. Would you like to see another remote viewing session? All right, so let's look at the news one that I did last month. So this already came out, uh, but this is the news one that I did, I guess not last month, but the month before that. Anyway, it was, uh, this is the C-RAM rocket, I guess, being lifted off from the, uh, from something, from some uh, USS, US naval carrier, if, I, if my memory is serving. But uh, anyway, so this was on the 22nd of March that I did this uh, session. This event happened in April. So let's look here. So I got my target coordinates, 1716, 1694. And I've got my physical state was okay. Emotionally, I'm okay. No advanced perceptuals. And uh, just I have my date, time, all that stuff. Uh, so, uh, solo session, so it's data type three, monitoring level solo. So subject ideogram, I got a subject over there. Another subject and another subject. I got land, I got a subject, and I got land again. Boom. So as you can see here, I've got this dry tan rough surface, semi-regular topography, dry natural smells. If I don't see something there, like if I'm saying that like there's not XYZ PDQ there, I don't say none of this there. I just don't write it. So of what I saw, this is what I saw. And then I'm seeing this big mountains in the distance and a solo subject for the flash sketch. And then as I'm keeping on going, I'm seeing this natural uh, vertical surface, solo subject. I'm seeing uh, distant flat lands with blocky white hues and stuff. Then I'm starting to see way off in the distance, I'm noticing, oh, there's water here at the, at the target. There's water. See, it didn't get me until page eight that I even noticed that there was an expansive body of water that was worth drawing. So you're getting little by little, little bit by bit, that the scene will open up to you. Got it? So be patient with yourself and don't feel like you have to get the whole thing right away. This doesn't look anything like it's about to be a rocket going off on a US naval carrier. That's not what this looks like it's gonna be. But you know what? It starts to look on page eight like you're getting somewhere, like you're getting towards something that could be something like that. All right, so natural salty smells, multiple structures, multiple subjects, natural harsh environment. This is why you wanna do it three times because you wanna give yourself three passes at the data to get as much as you possibly can. So as you're going, you're seeing loud noise. I'm, I'm getting loud noise, a siren. I deducted siren because that's a high level term. So I did capital D hyphen siren. And then it's mushy, wet, watery, expans uh, expansive, uh, expansiveness, land water interface. And then I'm saying, uh, when I probed for movement and activity, all I could feel was slow, listful structure on the water movement. So it's this like this listful movement of the structure. I just said it, yeah. So the environmental weather, temperature conditions, cool. I, as you see, I numbered one through seven, and I went through all of them. That's what I got. Pause, pause the video at any time if I'm going through any of this stuff too fast. So anyway, then I do the moving up and down type of thing. I started at M2, a subject on a structure on water near land. Land, and then I moved up a little bit. The land water is expansive, flat, and then irregular interfaces. Uh, the water is expansive and flat. The land is irregular and has a land water interface. The 5,000 feet above, I see multiple land masses with structures on water in between them. And then I'm seeing, when I'm moving forward, backwards, left, and right, then I'm seeing at the P2 subjects on the structure in water or land uh, on a structure that's in water near the land. I'm seeing sandy land at P3. At P1, uh, I'm seeing sandy land again. At P4, I'm getting land. At P5, I'm getting a regular topography. But then here I'm seeing structures, structures scattered between a regular topography. I'm seeing a lot more of this uh, water that's showing up as I'm doing an extra sketch because I got actually three things, two, two visuals come at me when I did the flash sketch. When in doubt, do not omit the data. Just put it down. 
So you got flash, uh, my first flash sketch was like this. Second flash sketch had this wide expanse of water that was sort of being thrown into my head as well. This sketch, and I wrote down, this sketch popped into my head while doing page eight and made the water seem like a less expansive lake. Expansive lake. Then, as I move to the center of the target and describe, because I don't know what I'm supposed to look at. I'm just looking at this environment. I'm seeing areas with land. I'm seeing areas that are regular land, some flatter land. I'm seeing some structures. I'm seeing some structures on water. I don't know what to look for. So then I move to the center of the target and describe. That cones my intention inward to the center of the target. What am I supposed to be looking at right now? Now that I've got this environment that I've illustrated. Well, then I'm looking at, boom. Right there, I'm seeing a boat-like structure on water. I draw it, and then it has these angular shapes, man-made structure, a subject, and an object that shoots upwards from far away. Going again, then I move to the target activity and describe. It returns back to me, the same scene from a different angle. I'm seeing water, I'm seeing that boat-like structure. An object shooting upwards, a metallic object. I touch the object, I'm probing the object. I'm touching it, it feels metallic. That's why I wrote metallic. Then, you see I'm seeing a mountain, I'm seeing a, a subject on the mountain, and then I'm moving, move to the target event and describe. I, I probe the dot, and then boom, right there, I'm seeing an object shooting up off a man-made flat base surface. That is exactly what was happening in the news session. We already did this news session. It was the CRAM rocket, the Naval CRAM rocket. This was a remote viewing session that found this news event a month before it even happened. That's remote viewing. That's what is at stake here for you to learn how to do these types of things. That's why I want you to learn how to use these, do these types of things because if you don't learn how to do these types of things, then you're moving through life like Helen Keller. You can't even see where you're going. What if you have a big decision to make in your life? Wouldn't it be convenient to be able to probe into your future selves if you do decision A and if you do decision B and then try to find out for yourself which one of those things leads you to a happier life? Wouldn't you want to have that ability for yourself? Well, you always had that ability for yourself. But that's why you're here on Earth, is because that's what the nature of this prison is. The nature of the prison is to cut yourself off from the source energy, the universal psychic internet that permeates through all things. Because when you have access to it, then you have access to directing intention towards your actual timelines that you want to have. If you see a timeline that you want to have, you can interrogate your future self in that timeline to figure out how do I get from point A to point B. This is a natural ability that all of us have and it was ripped away from us when we were born on this planet. And all of us here on this planet now must reclaim this thing. Freedom is not something that is given to you. It is something that you fight for. So you apply yourself. Use self-discipline to improve the quality of your life and do it today with remote viewing on your own. Make it a possibility. Make it a reality. There are other people who are doing this with you, so you're never actually alone. And you know what you're going to figure out is when you get your psychic feet wet, when you're getting out there and you're doing these types of probes, you're going to realize that there are other beings, many of them not even on this planet, who are able to see you when you go over there as a remote viewer. If your awareness is extending off, out of the planet, out of this world, sometimes on this world, you might, and you definitely will if you keep up with this, you're definitely going to find out there are so many psychic beings out there. So many of them. And that's why I use the word Helen Keller to describe so many of the people that are out here who don't believe in any of this thing. Who think that they have to, the only reason that they want to try to apply themselves is if somebody with a bigger title than them tells them that it's worth it. What bigger definition of a slave is there than somebody who doesn't believe in themselves? Thank you for sticking with me for this whole presentation. I really hope that you guys take remote, take remote viewing seriously and use it as a, something that you can apply to your own life. And uh, let me also say that you can, uh, let, me do the, let me show you this one last thing. So if you want to find targets for yourself, let's go to SRV, uh, let's go to Farsight, farsight.org, boom. So let's scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Look at all these projects that we did. You should be doing these projects for yourself. 
Figure out your own, you should see these things for yourself. Don't be content with us just telling you about these things. It's not cool unless you see them. I'm nowhere near good enough an artist to describe the amazingness of watching these things firsthand. And if you think like, oh, it's so foggy during the remote view, as you get better, it gets more HD. As you get better and as you calm your mind more, the calmer you are, the more tranquil you are, the more HD it is because you're able to really lock into that vibration of what's going on in these places. Anyway, let's go down to instruction. See instruction? Let's go to SRV free. And then boom, you got all these instructional materials and stuff for you to help you. So, target pools. A, B, and C are the exact same. They're just jumbled up. The numbers are jumbled up. So let's pick a random number. 13, 13A. Click on A, T13, boom. All right, so this will be your target. The Wells Fargo, San Francisco perspective, blah, 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 whatever. So that's how you would pick a target for yourself. You're exploiting nonlinear awareness. So it doesn't matter whether you pick the target before or after you do the session. You can pick the target before, like maybe you just tell yourself, okay, uh, target 56C. So then you go back over here, you do the full session, You'll, you write it down on a piece of paper, target 56C, and then you go, to the, you go to your full remote viewing session, then go to target pool C, and then you go down to 56, click 56, and then boom, you got the St. Louis Arch, Missouri, blah, blah, blah thing. So that's basically how you want to do it. You want to make sure you do a full remote viewing session, on these types of targets, okay? So these are a lot of, you know, what do you got here? Uh, 238 practice targets. Give yourself a chance to practice at least a couple of them. And if you're getting them right, good on you. If you're getting them wrong, stick with it. Be patient. This is a natural ability that you have and you can rehabilitate yourself to be able to do it fluently. And if you keep with it even more, you won't even need the SRV uh, template and you'll be able to get accurate data all on your own, just with your own psychic abilities. You're gonna be doing great things out there, guys. Just stick with it, push through, and most importantly, more than anything else, believe in yourself.